Please. Thank you very much, Mel, and thanks, uh, everybody. What a uh, wildly over-the-top introduction uh, and representative, truly, of many years of friendship, uh, a lot of cigars along the way. Great advice, Mel, Barbara, daughter Allie, thank you so much. And thanks for recognizing my wife, Laura, my daughters, Christina and Julia, who are here as well. Thank you so much. I, uh, I recognize the hour is late. Uh, Mel told me to talk for about two hours. Is everybody comfortable? No, I'm, and there are no slides. So I think we can move rapidly through this. I will say that uh, as an admiral who is increasingly starting to resemble the rhyme of the ancient mariner, it's, uh, it's pleasant to stand on the deck of a ship that's actually older and vastly more distinguished than I am. So my thanks to the intrepid as well. And let me say, to be pierside in New York City, how cool is that? What a great city this is. We should applaud it. It's iconic in this nation. I accept this award humbly, not for me, but on behalf of the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen and the coast guardsmen who stand the watch tonight. This is their award, not mine. Thank you. <clears throat> What I would like to do tonight, as we head into this Memorial Day, the word itself comes from memory, what I would like to do is not inflict upon you my own views, my own voice, but I would rather tonight give voice to the men and women who have fallen in our service. Together, these men and women, so many over the years, have stood the watch. They looked neither left nor right. They walked steadily and unafraid into mortal danger on our behalf. They did it on ships that roll at sea. They did it walking down dusty streets in Afghanistan and Iraq and a thousand other places. They did it flying through dangerous skies. They said simply, take me, I will go. And too many, too many were lost to us. Tonight, what I would like to do on this Memorial Day, as we head into this beautiful weekend, is simply read to you a few words from letters, and I warn you now, these are beautiful and sad letters. Some of them were written as last letters home. Some were written from grieving parents, and I will read two or three of them tonight, again to give voice to those who have fallen. I would like to begin by reaching well into our past with a letter from the Civil War. Major Sullivan Ballou, 32 years old, 2nd Regiment, Rhode Island Volunteers. He writes the night before the Battle of Bull Run to his wife, Sarah. My dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow lest I should not be able to write to you again. I feel impelled to write lines that may fall under your eye when I shall be no more. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It binds me to you with mighty cables that nothing could break. But my love of country comes over me like the wind and bears me irresistibly to the field of battle. Should I fall, never forget how much I love you. And when my last breath escapes me, it will whisper your name. Do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone and wait for thee, for we shall meet again. 
Sullivan Ballou, 32 years old, the Civil War. The second letter comes from World War I. It is a letter written by a grieving father from this very city who writes the following about the loss of his son in the First World War. It is hard to open the letters from those you love who you know are dead. But Quentin's last letters, written during his time at the front, when he spoke of his squadron, are written with real joy in the great adventure. He was engaged to a very beautiful girl, a very fine and high character, and it is heartbreaking for her as well as for his mother. He had his crowded hour. He died at the crest of life in the glory of the dawn. Quentin was a pilot who was shot down and died behind German lines just months before the end of the First World War. The dead son's full name was Quentin Roosevelt. He was the youngest son of President Theodore Roosevelt, a New York father who lost his beloved son in that war. Let me now come forward to the wars in which we are engaged today, in which so many in uniform tonight have participated, where we have lost many shipmates. Let me read a letter from Private First Class Diego Rincon of Georgia. He wrote his last letter home to be opened in the event of his death to his mother. He said, whether I make it or not, it's all part of the plan. It can't be changed, only completed. Mother will be the last word I'll say. Your face will be the last picture that goes through my eyes. I hope you're proud of what I am doing and you have faith in my decisions. I will try hard and not give up. And I want to say sorry for anything I have ever done wrong. I'm doing it all for you, Mom. I love you. Diego Rincon, Iraq. Another letter from Iraq from a U.S. Army captain, Michael McKinnon, to his young daughter, Madison. Madison, I'm sorry I broke my promise to you when I said I was coming back. You were the jewel of my life. I don't think anyone will ever be good enough for you. Stay beautiful. Stay sweet. You will always be daddy's little girl. Captain Michael McKinnon died in October 2005 in Iraq. More recently, another father, a close friend of mine, gave voice and image to his son, <clears throat> a Marine lieutenant lost in today's battlefield in Afghanistan. The father said, Robert was killed protecting our country its people, and its values from a terrible and relentless enemy in Afghanistan. We are a broken-hearted but proud family. He was a wonderful and precious boy leading a meaningful life. He was in exactly the place he wanted to be, doing exactly what he wanted to do, surrounded by the best men on this earth, his Marines and a Navy doc. This letter was written by a cherished friend of mine, Marine Lieutenant General John Kelly. My friends, I would ask you, what do we learn from letters like these? What can we take away as we celebrate this Memorial Day? To answer that, I'd like to quote one last letter, another just-in-case letter from Private First Class Jesse Givens, which was delivered to his wife and his children, opened only in the event of his death. My family, he writes, I never thought I would be writing a letter like this. I really don't know where to start. The happiest moments in my life all deal with my family. I will always have with me the small moments we shared. The moments when we quit taking life so seriously and smiled. The sounds of a little boy's laughter. The nudge of an unborn baby. You will never know how complete you have made me. 
I did not want to write this letter. There is so much more I need to say, so much more I need to share. Please keep my baby safe. Find it in your heart to forgive me for leaving you alone. Teach our children to live life to the fullest. Tell yourself to do the same. I will always be there with you. Do me a favor. After you tuck the children in, give them hugs and kisses for me. Go outside. Look at the stars and count them. Don't forget to smile. Love always. Your husband, Jess. This letter delivered in May 2003, two weeks before the birth of their son and just after his death in combat. So I say again, what do we take from these letters? So sweet and sad and powerful in their simplicity and their honesty. Three points that I would leave us with tonight. First, most obviously, most importantly, we are a lucky nation to have such men and women who say to us, take me, I will go. Second, that the words in these letters matter. That these lives, <clears throat> these lives of the fallen, had weight and importance that live on in our hearts and our minds. And that we will read their letters in events like this and respect them and grieve with their families for their loss and most importantly, that we continue to support their families like Intrepid, like the Fisher family, like all of you, we will remember. And third, and this is the note I would close on, that for all of us who are so lucky to go on with our lives in this world, safe and protected because of the sacrifices of others, that we should live our lives to the fullest. And so to that end, I would close this magical night on this extraordinary ship by repeating the words of Private First Class Jess Givens, who will be forever young in our hearts and our prayers. And what he tells us is far more profound than anything I could have offered you tonight. What Jess said, Jess Given said in that letter, was hug and kiss your children, go outside and look at the stars, and don't forget to smile. That's pretty good advice for Memorial Day, because in the end, what else really matters? Again, thank you. This is the award for those men and women who have fallen. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.